Hey, welcome back, everybody. Time again for another episode of Living Hope, a weekly journey designed to provide hope, inspiration, and education for those living with pancreatic cancer, sharing the real-life stories of those really affected by this deadly disease and how they deal with it on a daily basis. With a woman who's always dealing with it, one way or another, (laughs) hopefully for good here, Roberta Luna, welcome. Thank you, thank you. Yes, so far so good. So we'll stay on on that track for now. Thank you, thank you guys for joining us again and and listening. We really appreciate it. or watching whichever you happen to be doing today. I want to welcome back Lee Rettler and his wife Dwayne. Thank you both for returning. And we did it once before. We did Zoom and we had a little bit of technical difficulty. So I'm really happy you guys were able to actually make it in. It makes it a little bit easier. And I'm really still out of my comfort zone, but I'm more comfortable doing it this way than on Zoom. I'm still having troubles getting used to that. But for both of you, again, thank you for coming and being here with us and sharing your story. For those that might have missed when we did it before, can you just give us a little background, a little history on what your connection is with pancreatic cancer? Dwayne, you want to go first? Sure. (laughs) Well, many years ago, in 2003, my husband was diagnosed with pancreatic cancer. Uh, And it was, as it often is, rapid and unexpected. And shortly after that, my sister became ill with another form of cancer. And so I was really having a hard time struggling with loss, obviously, and uh, moved, segue 15 years later, moved 15 Mm -hmm. Years later, from the East Coast to the West Coast, and happened to uh, meet the gentleman to my left, <laughs> only to find that, as you talk about of all the minutia that you go through in your life, uh, both of our spouses died from the same disease. So that was an immediate connection, for sure. And how long um, was it between the time of your husband's death and when you met Lee? Oh, about 15, a little over 15 years. 15 years, yeah. wow, that's a good time. And um, if this isn't too personal, did you and your husband, his name was Chuck? Yeah. Did mm-hmm. you have children? Yes, we okay. had one Had one daughter who lives in uh, Costa Mesa now. She's Oh, good, close by. 42 almost, although she'll be happy, <laughs> unhappy that I said that. Well, I'm sure she's a beautiful 42, so I mean, if she looks anything like her mom, I'm sure she's gorgeous, so thank you. <laughs> <laughs> and Lee, can you tell us a little bit about about your wife, Sally? So my wife was a hospice nurse and mother of our two children. And in 2014, presented with some pain and weight loss and subsequently diagnosed with pancreatic cancer. Had uh, chemotherapy and struggled with it for a year and a half and passed away at the end of 2015. And following that, I was deeply saddened, but went back and practice medicine, which I found therapeutic, helping other people, focusing less on myself. I formed a, what I called the sad guys group. I found a <laughs> bunch of guys who had lost their wife and really were equally sad and having difficulty coping because professional help wasn't what we needed. We just needed some camaraderie. So we had dinner once a month. And I did that for a year. And then on the subsequent, so a year and a half later at New Year's, I visited a neighbor for a New Year's party. And she actually threw me out and sent me home and said, you don't belong here. You're not a good, uh, sad person. Get rid of the sad guys group and start moving forward with life. And I didn't like the words move forward, move on. I found them uh, irritating. I think as we all do. But she said, I want you to go home and try to make some step to try to meet somebody with whom you can have some interaction. So I went to an online dating service, uh, took proof that I did it, took it back, and she invited me back to dinner. (laughs) So they became really good friends. But I really needed that persuasion about somebody who cared about me to move um, to a different uh, chapter of my life rather than continuing just being sad. And that's probably, like I said, the best advice you got. But do you still see any of your members of your sad boys club? Boys club? Sad guys group. <laughs> Sorry, I really had it wrong. Sad guys group. No, I ended up doing the dishes each time. So I think it was probably, <laughs> after a year, it was it probably was less productive than, than I'd hoped it would be. But uh, I, it gave me some recognition that by having them for dinner or occasionally going out for dinner, that there's a common bond among people with cancer. Cancer is a really horrible thing to have happen to a loved one and to their to the spouse of the individual who, who's losing someone. So I 
was very open during my wife's illness about getting help and dealing with my own anxiety and emotion. But uh, afterwards, that continued. So it was nice to have that bond. It is, and we always say, you know, cancer doesn't just affect the patient or the survivor. It, it really affects the whole family. The whole family becomes involved. So how long did it take you to get, after your wife's death, to get kind of back into the circle of, of dating again? Did that happen? Did it take a while? Did it happen quickly? Well, I really didn't have interest except uh, at that New Year's Eve party, which was a year and a half later. And it really was a persuasion that, I'm a social individual. I like people. I like being around them. I found a, a real need to spend time with other people. And that I was now able to do it without talking just about my sadness, talking about uh, activities, sports, travel, uh, life on the beach, my family, things that were still important to me and in my future. And that's the point when she was smart enough to recognize that it was time for me to have a future. So it was a year and a half. When your spouses were going through this, did you, and this can be either both of you or one of you, did did you talk about what would happen when they passed, that they wanted you to continue with life, they wanted you to date, yes. or was that subject not approached at all? Yes, my husband and I did talk about it. His course of the disease was very brief between uh, mid-September and end of December, so uh, time was kind of compressed a great deal, and we did talk about it. He was very adamant about all of that. Um, of course, I would hear none of it as most spouses do. And, you know, we plan, he planned some things that he wanted to do and how he wanted things to be handled. So, yeah, there was a candid um, exchange all the time because we, we all knew, uh, myself, my daughter, and my husband, we were all pretty candid about the situation, much as it was, you know, horrible. So, yeah, for us it was, it was good to be open about it. And I think all of us benefited from that greatly. Yeah, I know it's a difficult subject, but it's something a lot of times I know is what when my dad was going, we were going with my dad. It's one thing he wanted is my mom to get back and, you know, not be alone. And but unfortunately, she took a different road. It wasn't something she was interested in. So I'm just curious if other couples face that and talk about that or not. It's kind of a soft, you know, a hard subject to, to discuss. But I think it's something that we all do need to discuss and take care of. So. Um, Lee, do you have anything for, to add with that? or just... Well, my uh, wife had two issues. First, she was a hospice nurse. So she this was part of her training and her behavior, just to really talk about death and talk about the future. And I was the one more resistant because I kept uh, hoping that a breakthrough would come and traveling around and going to various centers and hoping that this would be the drug that would make uh, further improvement. So I was in denial. And then she was deeply religious, and so she accepted this as God's will for her and was not fearful of dying, and she didn't think I should be either, and it was just not it was not the end of her existence and the end of her love for me. So uh, in those two cases, it was rel relatively unique. Yeah, and a very unselfish act as well, I think, mm -hmm. you know, for us to want our spouses to continue and have a life after we are gone. Um, I know we did kind of touch on a little bit that I thought the way you guys met was a little bit different than what I expected, to be honest with you. Um, I expected that you probably met from a support group. That's just why I would think two people would come together who lost spouses to the same disease. Can you just kind of tell us a little bit how it is you actually did meet and come together? <laughs> okay, so I tried a support group, and it was a failure for me. I went to a grief recovery group at the church that I went to, and there were about 40 of us in the group, and another person who was a dentist and I, who was a physician, both looked at each other after we were about halfway through and decided that we were better off giving back to the world and making a difference in other people's lives rather than spending the time talking about how sad we were. So we left and looked for other avenues to feel some uh, joy. So... That's how I dealt with grief, and the the rest of the question was how you how you met. I like I said, okay. I thought you guys met from a support group, but I was very much surprised to find out it was totally a different way. No, you so met. I I abandoned the support group, <laughs> created the sad guys dinner group, and moved forward with that. And then after the year and a half, I did what my friend Julie asked me to do, which was to go on an online dating service, 
And we did, and I uh, dated a few women, and then I dated Dwayne and just had a spectacular connection, totally unrelated to the fact that we had this in common. I think it was after we'd been talking for about an hour, we said, well, by the way, what did your spouse die of? And that's how we found out. What was your reaction when you found out you both had lost your spouse to pancreatic cancer? It was absolutely uncanny. I, I, I can't even imagine. But it was, it was a moment, for sure. It's not something I, I hear of too often. Usually, like I said, it's either, you know, maybe in a support group and not usually on a dating app like that. It was a really good <laughs> joint adventure for both of you. And if I can ask, what attracted you to each other? He's just organically a wonderful person. I mean, he, there's no pretense. Um, he's easy to talk to. It was like having dinner with a good friend. I liked that. I thought it was quite charming. Oh, good. Do you want to add anything to that? It really wasn't wasn't the fact that we had something in common. I mean, it was mm -hmm. just a uh, happenstance. It was the fact that I was, she was an enjoyable person to talk to, and she had a lot in common with me, caring about family and uh, had a business and developed and was her own person. Not needy, that was very clear, and self-sufficient, <laughs> loving, and good-looking. Yeah, very good looking, I must say. <laughs> so I think all those were attributes. Uh, the pancreatic cancer was just pure happenstance. Yeah, just was there, right? Not really anything that exactly. drew you to each other. It was before before you knew you had that connection. Right. right. And you both have children. And how long did you date before you got married? Two years. About two About years. About two years. Mm -hmm. yeah. And how did the family take the new, you know, the new additions. I mean, it's, sometimes it's difficult to I'll speak move to on. that. <laughs> I, I have an only daughter, so, of course, you know, I had dated over the years. It took me about, I did not participate in a grief support group. For me, too many other things were happening in, in my life, including my sister's illness, and I just felt too stretched too, too many different ways. So I took the time to incorporate all of this, you know, into my life slowly and with the help of friends, but... um when my daughter met him, it became completely obvious that she adored him. Oh. And she'll cry at his birthday. I mean, <laughs> it's, it's really, uh, it's very touching. And I'm very lucky. And I think uh, I used to kid Lee that she would fall on a bayonet for him. She's, <laughs> it's just, she's just that person. And she loves everything about him. And she feels blessed. She said to him once in a card and at a dinner in front of uh, the small group of family that I know you'll never be my dad, but I can sure see you as a grandfather to my grandkids oh, to wow. her, or two sons. She has two boys. So I thought that was pretty telling about how that went. So it's been wonderful. Mm. I've been very lucky. I'm glad, I'm and, glad to hear yeah. that. It's wonderful. Yeah, wonderful. I'm lucky too. She's wonderful. Good. So it's great. <laughs> <Those parts>. <laughs> <laughs> and your children are good with this yeah. as well. Okay. I have no, no issues whatsoever. Good, because sometimes you know when you when you lose a, a parent and then they go and find somebody else's, it can be a little bit difficult. And I know I've I've spoken with people who have lost a spouse, but I've not been with somebody who's both lost a spouse to the same illness, the same disease. How do you guys manage to keep that separate, or how do you entwine that with your lives, the, their memory? How do you deal with all that? Well, I have a phrase called strength in what remains. And I think when you're working with somebody or when you're living with somebody that's going through this horrible disease, you've got to be open and honest and you have to learn to just squeeze the joy out of every day. And I think that's what has helped me probably more than anything is to find strength in whatever's left to you, children, activities, good memories, um, the love you had for the person. It all provides those little bits of push to get you back into the world. And that, that's what I found really useful. Mm. And Lee, do you have anything to add to that? Or you? I think we're really both very candid about the love we had for our first spouse and just don't compare at all. I was sharing with, earlier today with, with Dwayne, I said, my wife Sally, really, the memories are great because she shaped me, made me more sensitive, more caring, more loving, better listener. All those things are good memories I take with me. 
So, you know, even though she's no longer with me in flesh, she's still with me in terms of affecting me and changing me as a person. And I hope I'm a better husband to Dwayne as a result of that. Yeah, I think her being a hospice nurse really says a lot because that is a really difficult thing to do, and I don't know that I could do that. And so I'm really happy to have somebody like mm-hmm. her out there So in those memories. So thank you. Do you guys celebrate, like, their birthdays or your anniversaries with them um, when you were married? Do you celebrate those days? Casually, we talk about it. Like, today is actually my anniversary. Oh, wow. It would have been 43 years. Oh, wow. I, and we acknowledge them, I think. I, I don't, we don't, you know, do a, a lot more than that and just sort of be appreciative of the fact that we're together and that we revere our spouses and, and hopefully have learned a lot from them because I think your spouse teaches you a lot that you need to learn when you go forward in your life in whatever situation it is. A lot of times, you know, when somebody is is touched by pancreatic cancer and then they lose that that person, they either tend to jump in and want to get really involved or they run the other way and don't want to ever talk or hear about it again. What made the both of you decide that you wanted to get involved and honor their memory in, in doing what you've been doing for pancreatic cancer? Well, it's just an opportunity, really, because during my situation, there was no pancreatic cancer action network. <laughs> so there was nothing. So there was no outlet to do anything. And I had uh, worked as a trainer in a mental health facility for a while, and there was no venue for me to to even take that going forward because I, I had changed careers. But when I met Lee, he got interested in it. And so I kind of liked to think of myself as his gal Friday in that situation because <laughs> he's more rooted in the community where I'm still fairly new to the West mm-hmm. Coast, only having been here maybe five, five years, six years. So it puts me in a different situation. So I'm kind of right on his coattails, what it used to be, what are which some, is nice. <laughs> what are some of the things that you want to do to honor them or to remember them or to help bring awareness to this disease? Before that, it gives me pleasure to do it. So I really, at the end of the day, I'm always happier when I've done something to help somebody else. And I think people will really listen to someone who's lost a spouse to pancreatic cancer rather than somebody who's just treated it as a physician. Because if you're you're a few feet away from them, but you're not going home and living with the pain that they're going through, it's not the same as when you experience it yourself. You you're there wishing it weren't the case. You're wanting to come up with a cure. And so... When you do something for others, you yourself benefit. And then the second thing is I really do believe we're trying to honor our spouses because their spirit lives in us and we're kind of feeding that by doing something to help with pancreatic cancer, help others who are dealing with it, provide funding for pancreatic cancer research, and just getting the word out. So those are things that give us joy. (laughs) Thank you. It, it's I know it can be difficult, and you know, um, you were saying, or we were talking earlier about even like as a survivor. I know there's a lot of survivor guilt. As a caregiver, do you suffer? Or do you have any caregiver guilt on your own, or heard from others that might share that? Yes, I think in my family, I've had other family members with pancreatic cancer. Uh, subsequent to my husband uh, getting pancreatic cancer, two other family members have it. On your Uh, side? No. Oh, on his side? Yes. And I think it's very hard as you get older not to have some guilt. I always found it useless. It doesn't help you move forward. It leaves you stuck where you are. And I know I did uh, with one of my family members. I, I kept just encouraging not to dwell on that. There's There are no mistakes when you love somebody and try to care for them. And you do the best you can. I don't know how you feel about it, but I just... Well, I know earlier... It's a when, tough one. It, it, it really is, but I know earlier when we talked, I remember Lee mentioned that he thought, you know, he wished he would have seen some signs earlier. One of those is when you were on the beach and she wanted mm-hmm. to go by George Clooney's house, right. which I totally agree with. <laughs> but um, after a every while... Every day, I would add. It wasn't just once, <laughs> okay, every, just day. every day. I would, don't know. I would do it every day, but at least yeah. once. But yet, And then you noticed there was a time when she just didn't feel like walking there and then when she got into a pair of clothes that she said she fit into her skinny jeans Mm -hmm. you wish that you you thought you should have seen the signs um, earlier but and as a physician um, you know I I don't know if that carries an extra guilt because you would think but it's just one of those things I don't think any of us see that but do you have um, any any leads on that or any 
I think because I know it really wouldn't have made a difference because she did respond to the first courses of chemotherapy. If I had found it a month or three months or four months earlier, for example, the one month earlier when signs showed up, I'm convinced it wouldn't have made a difference. So, no, no, I really don't. But as a physician who's treated pancreatic cancer and cancers in general, I think guilt is the norm. I don't think it's unusual. I think the majority of people, more in some cultures and in some age groups, but feel horribly guilty that they didn't do something and guilty that they're, as Dwayne pointed out, that they're still around, the survivor's guilt. Yes, and that's a really a heavy one, but we can talk about that another time. Sure. But I do remember, like, with my dad when he was diagnosed, um, thinking I had seen early symptoms, thinking I should have thought maybe that that was a clue to pancreatic cancer, but we were actually looking at it as to being involved in a car accident he had earlier because mm-hmm. he had some tenderness in the area. You know, he would undo his pants and kind of put, you know, his hands to move, you know, anything away from that area. But I had a doctor who actually treats pancreatic cancer and is a surgeon um, tell me, because I was feeling the guilt really bad, as he told me, he said, you know what, I'm a pancreatic cancer surgeon, and I didn't see it in my own dad, so how could you have seen it in yours? So I think that was the best advice I ever got, was to realize that if somebody that experienced couldn't pick it up, there wasn't anything I could do either. So, um, But it is a heavy subject hmm. for caregivers as well as for survivors. But is there anything th- that you could have done different, or you felt you could have done di- different for your spouses? I had no warning whatsoever. In fact, there was some issue with his discomfort, um, and he, his best friend was a family physician, went immediately. They determined they'd, they'd go through the usual, very uh, basic protocol, blood work, uh, and did a CAT scan even, going a little bit further, and found that it was just, there was nothing there. You're You're fine. You're, you're you probably need a couple stents, maybe a little blockage here. We're going to take care of that. It'll be an outpatient treatment. And he had that done, felt a bit better, but still said, you know, I still don't feel quite right. And it was only when they did a CAT scan a bit lower where it found the tumor in a very unusual place, wrapped around an artery and was not caught on the first CAT scan. So there was, a, there was no warning. There was, we went from, here are a few procedures we can do because you have some issues with your heart and blood flow, and then we went right from that within within a matter of two weeks to, oh, here it is, it's pancreatic cancer. And how long did he survive after he was diagnosed? Uh, three months. Yeah. Very quickly. Yeah, three months. Yeah. And unfortunately, that's what we see a lot of those where mm-hmm. they get diagnosed and they're not with us for very long, so it's difficult. But um, is there any advice that you would have for any caregivers out there? Um, I know you talk about sharing memory, sharing the good times, doing as much as possible with them while they're here. Is there anything anything specific you could share with them? Dwayne's comment about squeeze the joy out of every day, every hour, absolutely the best. I don't think there's any advice Cause that's, a memory. that's better than that. Just squeeze it. Just I can remember it. doing that. I remember uh, wheeling my husband to get his radiation or chemotherapy, and it would be fall, and the leaves all would be falling, mm-hmm. you know, just heavily on the on the sidewalks, and we'd kick them around. And then one day he felt really well enough to go to the movies. I mean, there are those simple, simple things to find something positive in a bad situation that can leave you with a greater degree of comfort, I think. And I think that's the best you can hope for, really. Mm. Yeah, I agree. It's all little just, things. Yeah, the little things mm-hmm. and squeeze those those memories out. Yeah. And, I mean, it really is important to, you know, stop and talk to each other and communicate and, and have an open line. And I really appreciate, you know, you both coming in and sharing with us. And I really want to have you back because there's so much more to talk about that, you know, we don't get to do in this little bit of time. But before we do leave, is there any other words of wisdom or anything you'd like to leave with people? Well, I, I'm a firm believer in that little quote, strength and what remains. You hold on to all the positives. You deal with honesty and openness, if you can, with your loved one. And, and somehow we all muddle through. Yes, we all we do muddle through and we get through. Um, Lee, anything ex- anything that we didn't maybe I missed? I know there is a lot we wanted to talk about. So if there is anything, you can get in there really quickly. <laughs> oh, I just be be thankful for each day you have with someone. And for me, it's just not focusing on the fact that I don't have her and 
haven't had her for a long time, is that I had my wife for 45 years. She changed me. She lives in me still and is motivating me to help with pancreatic cancer, pancan network, and doing things that I think will help others. And just real quick, this just popped into my head. Um, sorry, <laughs> but um, for because like I said, you're you are really the only the first couple I've met that both have d- lost somebody to pancreatic sure. cancer. What would your advice be to someone who lost their spouse to pancreatic cancer and has remarried? Um, is there anything that you can share with maybe the new spouse coming in, or with um, anything in that way that so that they can feel, you know, that it's not that they don't love me and they still love, you know, the deceased more, but anything you can share with them. That's such a very dynamic situation. It's really, <laughs> we may have to do another yeah, show, right? <laughs> that would be a whole other show, I'm afraid. I'm not really sure if if there's any uh, program for that, if you will. I think you've got to just be available and emotionally to each other, family, and hope that that translates into a good relationship mm-hmm. and that your love for each other is evident to them. But we don't compete and compare oh, about what the spouses would have done or are like. Uh, so I would, I would encourage people not to do that. So I think a, a success model is to honor the person, to recognize them, talk about them, look at their pictures, put the pictures out, uh, rejoice that we had that time. We had children together with that spouse and to be open about it. But uh, I think Dwayne's given the best advice, squeeze that joy. Yes. When you have them. And we feel, in a strange way, we fe- I think, I'll speak for myself, I feel like I know Sally. Mm. I know her through him, and I know her through her close friends with whom I'm still friendly. Oh, nice. And yeah. I think that's, I think he, f- he feels he knew Chuck. Right, right. And so that's really, I think that's very terrible. Being with his family was great recently. and uh, Oh, yeah. It's it's those little I'd things. like to have a beer with them. <laughs> yeah. Well, I think you guys are a great example, and I hope people will look to that. And like you say, those that are experiencing, you know, remarriage, look into, you know, listen to this, watch the other ones that they, that they you know, when they joined us first and did. I think you guys are a great role model, and I thank you. And um, as we leave, I do have a little favorite quote I like of myself. It says, as long as you speak my name, I shall live forever. Today, we are dedicating Living Hope to Sally Rittler and to Chuck Matei. But we want to dedicate today's show to them. And thank you both for coming and sharing your story with us. And we really want to have you come back because, like I say, there's so much more that we want to talk about that I didn't even get halfway through. So I appreciate you guys joining us. And thank you so much. Sure. Our pleasure. Our pleasure. Well, there you have it. Another great reason to tune in each and every week as we take this journey called Living Hope, designed to provide hope, inspiration, and education for those living with pancreatic cancer and all those around them, sharing the real-life stories of those really affected by this deadly disease and how everybody, the patient, their family, their friends, all deal with it, still sometimes on a daily basis. If you'd like to share your stories, please contact us here at the station, and if you know anybody that needs help, like right now, there's a number to call. Patient services at PANCAN, 877-2-P-A-N-C-A-N for the Pancreatic Cancer Action Network. For the OC Talk Radio Network, I'm Paul Roberts, inviting you to ride along as we continue to share this journey we call Living Hope.